about Winbridge research mediums, but then they would be worms, and we didn't think that they would like that. So we threw in the C. So the, the mediums go through this eight-step process that we, um, they fill out a questionnaire, we do psychological tests, they, they're interviewed a number of times, and then the big one is step five, they do tested, they do blinded test readings for deceased. So that's the big one. And then if they pass step five, they go on to six, seven, and eight, which are training. So they're trained in the history of mediumship research. Um, they take the online human subjects research training that all investigators are required to take. Um, and then we train them about grief because all of the people that they work with uh, are grieving people. Um, so the next method that I want to talk about is pairing. So historically, when people did mediumship research, they often sort of randomly selected five dead people and their respective sitters, and they made a medium read, you know, all five, and then they gave the five readings to each of the five people, and they said, pick yours. But what if all of those five people, you know, were grandmothers who liked to bake and sew and were short, and, you know, what, how would you pick your reading? So we specifically pair two deceased people to be as different as possible in physical and personality descriptions, how they spent their time, their hobbies and such, and cause of death. And uh, actually on the airplane on the way here, I was, the gentleman next to me made the mistake of asking me what I did. And we, uh, he was a graduate student um, in psychology, and so he was very interested. And so we got into all of these methods, and he said, well, then isn't it obvious which reading is yours? And I said, only if the medium's doing what she says she's doing. Only if it's real is it obvious. So um, we, again, we want to optimize the process um, for the sitter. So if you have two deceased people who are very similar, that's not really testing a, a sitter's ability to distinguish between the two. So I talked about screening and pairing, and I'm going to go through a, a typical, how do, we, how do we do a reading with a medium? And, and it'll cover these other um, methods. So first we start with a medium who is blinded to all information about the, um, the deceased and the sitter. And the medium and I set up a phone appointment, and I call the medium up. And, and I'm also blinded to all information um, about the deceased and the sitter. And all we have is a first name. So I say, for, in this example, the discarnate's name is Susie. And the medium um, does a reading on the phone, just she and I on the phone. Um, you might notice when I talk about mediums in general, I, I use she, I use the feminine. And um, that's because 90% of the mediums that we work with are, or that I've encountered are female. We have one male medium and he has given me his permission to always use she and not be offended. Um, so just the medium and I on the phone, uh, we do a reading and where I specifically ask the medium about Susie's physical and personality descriptions, how she spent her time and, and uh, cause of death. And we get the Susie reading. And then at another time we do another reading for the paired discarnate. The paired um, discarnates are always of the same gender so that you can't distinguish your reading if it talks about a mustache. Though I said that to Dean Radin once and he said, well, some people's grandmother might have a mustache. <laughs> um, so that wouldn't be. Um, so then I take the audio um, recordings of those two readings and I transcribe them and format them into individual item lists so that each um, numbered item is an individual piece of information. And I take out all reference to the names, and I make everything a, a, a definitive statement. So if the medium's experience is, I think I'm kind of seeing that maybe her hair was red. I say, she had red hair um, in the transcript. Because you can't you know, say true or false to maybe kind of a little bit. So I make them definitive statements. And so then I, I'm work. We create item lists A and B, or one and two, or whatever it turns out to be. And each of those two lists are given to the two respective sitters, you know, Susie's um, husband and Cheryl's daughter, or whoever the sitters happen to be. And they don't know which one is which, because all the names have been removed. And they give each item um, in the list a score and they also give the whole reading a score from zero to six. And so for example, this would be an example. So um, they, five and two and one and four, are just the examples in, in, this, um, in this slide. And then 
We, so they give each item a score, the whole reading a score, and then we say, pick which one you think was yours. And that whole process is quintuple blinded. So the medium is blinded to information about the discarnate and the sitter. Um, the sitters are blinded to which um, reading was intended for their discarnate. The experimenter who trains and screens and consents the sitters at the very beginning is blinded to who, which medium reads which sitters. And um, the experimenter, who is me, uh, who talks to the medium on the phone during the reading is blinded to the um, information about the sitter, the discarnate. And the experimenter who interacts with the sitters during scoring is blinded to which reading is which and who read who. And um, when I explained this to one of our mediums, she said, so um, no one knows anything? And I said, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, so this, this is a skeptic. Um, this is, uh, <laughs> as this face, some of you may recognize, this expression you may have encountered yourselves. Um, this quintuple blind protocol accounts for all the normal explanations that um, skeptics will throw out. Fraud, how is the medium going to look up your credit card number or sift through your trash or whatever if all she has is a first name of the deceased person. Um, it prevents cueing, either intentional or unintentional, on the part of the experimenter who's interacting with the medium. Um, you know, if the medium says, I'm feeling pain in the chest area, I can't say, do you mean kidney cancer? Like, I can't drive her in the right answers because I don't know, I don't know anything about um, the, the discarnate. It prevents what's called rater bias. Some people have a tendency to score things as either, you know, everything's right and some people have a tendency to score everything as wrong. And we don't, we're not looking at some, there's no bar of success that we're looking at. We just compare the scores given that keep, that sitters give their own readings compared to scores that sitters give the other reading. And um, we're just looking at the difference between the two. So when sitters don't know which reading is theirs, it prevents reader bias, um, where people have a tendency to score things higher or lower if they know that they were intended for them. Um, it prevents the theory that uh, mediums readings are so general they could apply to anyone because we ask those specific questions about the living person. So they can't get away with the person misses you and they love you. 100% correct. Um, that we they, we make them answer these specific questions and then it prevents what's called cold reading which is when a fraudulent medium um, uses cues visual auditory body language cues from the sitter to fabricate an act an accurate reading so this is my favorite example of um, a, a experiment or a, a situation that includes all of these things. So this is talking to the dead with your host rat. So um, it's a, a John Edwards style um, studio audience there. And so rat says, is there a Karen in the studio audience tonight? So there he already has information about the sitter. Um, yes, it's me. I'm here with my brother. And he says, and I've told you I have a cousin who's passed. And now he also has a relationship of the discarnate. And they say, yes, we do. And he says, wait, wait, I think he's here. I think it's him. He's telling me when his life ended, his heart stopped. Yes, yes, that's true. His heart stopped. And I think I'm seeing his face. Did your cousin, did he have a forehead? Yes, he had a forehead. And it says, whoa, hang on. I'm getting his name. It's it's, is it, is it Bob? And they say, it's him, we love you, Bob. But their shirts say, we miss you, Bob. Talk to us, Bob. And they say, how does he do that? <laughs> I contacted this artist and I have permission to, to use this. Um, so we can, we can rule out all of those normal explanations um, that skeptics put forth by, for explaining a medium's success. And so what we're left with are three paranormal explanations. The first being survival of consciousness, that there's life after death and some aspect of me continues to exist after my body dies. Then there's what's called the psychic reservoir hypothesis, which um, states that all information since the beginning of time is stored somehow and somewhere in the universe, and mediums are just accessing that. Um, the other day I heard someone call it the hard drive, the universal hard drive, um, and getting their information. And so this is similar to Jung's collective unconscious, um, the Akashic record, it, it, that's the same sort of idea, and um, Yeats, um, Spiritus Mundi, the, those all are sort of explaining the same thing. 
And then um, the other theory is called super psi. 